One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to AmericanWarning2022.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, www.americanwarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's December 8th. It's a Thursday, 2022, getting closer to the end of the year. But before we wrap up the year, we need to talk about cryptocurrencies, FTX, Bitcoin pulling back, stable coins. What's going on? We have a great guest coming up with us right now. Bradley Kimes, founder of Digital Perspectives, coming up right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 8th of December, 2022. As I mentioned, we're talking cryptocurrencies, anything and everything cryptocurrencies. We got Bradley Kimes coming on. He is the founder of Digital Perspective, and he's going to dive into what went on with FTX, uh, what's going on with the entire crypto market right now. We're going to talk about stable coins and USD Tether. It's very important to know about stable coins, what they are. He breaks that down for us, talks about the Ripple case, how that's going to end, when the case is actually going to get resolved, hopefully, in the next couple of months. So right now, we're going to bring on Bradley Kimes because we're going to dive into anything and everything cryptocurrencies. And here he is right now, the man I've been talking about, Brad Kimes. Brad, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we got to jump right into this. I mean, 2022 has been a really wacky, to put it nicely without using any four-letter words, of a year for many, many reasons and many asset classes. You know, bonds set to have one of their worst years in, in a century, stocks getting crushed, Cryptos, uh, obviously, have been followed along with that. So why don't we just dive into the big picture? Now, if you could take a look back at the last 11 and a half months, kind of what your view is of, of what the hell has been going on the last 11 and a half months with crypto. Well, Matt, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, uh, I, I, you know, to just to pull back very quickly here, the space itself is in a transitional phase. Right. It is in a phase of going from no regulation to regulation. And it's not pretty what's happening. Right. And we've got everything to go along with it from the systemic cascading collapses that we've now learned come from the FTX platform and the cascading effects of that. And then we move on to there may still be another hurdle in front of us, which is like a USD tether, which happens to be a bottleneck for digital dollars getting into and out of these exchanges and spaces to buy these assets. So let's go a little bit further along that tether and we'll come back to FTX. Obviously, we're going to dive into that uh, with tether, you know, just to make it simple, you know, you know it's basically tracks a dollar, if, if I'm not mistaken. And is it as safe? as owning a, do a dollar in your hand, as safe as owning uh, a dollar in the bank, or is it not actually backed by a U.S. dollar? Well, it's a fantastic question, Matt, and it's one I've been asking for a couple of years now. Um, I think that there are huge problems with USD Tether. And the reason I believe that is because the Department of Justice has reached out to USD Tether and asked for them to show the accountant books, the reserves and everything to go along with it. And what we have found out and learned thus far, and we don't know everything, but what we found out thus far is this. We found out that Tether told Department of Justice to go fly a kite. That's what they told them. You don't have enough evidence to see our books. That's what they said. Now, that to me, I, I don't know if that's got a lot of wisdom in it. So for uh, USD Tether, if I could just level set for everybody listening, uh, is that, you know, USD Tether is a digital dollar that is supposed to be pegged to a physical dollar. Uh, 
Now that could be bonds or other things held and to back it. And it should be a one-to-one or a surplus. Now, again, as we mentioned, the Department of Justice sent a letter wanting to see those reserves in the accounting firm and how that's being done. And they told them, we're not doing it. We don't believe you have enough evidence to see our books. Now, full disclosure, Tether is uh, uh, filed and registered with FinCEN. But uh, Caitlin Long in this space has said many, many times, just because you're registered with an agency doesn't mean you're regulated by it. So that's Mm -hmm. a key statement to take away. The other thing that is a big concern for me is that Dell Tech Bank is the bank that is supposed to be, or at least one of them, holding the reserves for Tether. Well, Dell Tech Bank just had Gregory Pepkin on, I believe it was uh, another show, whatever it was, forgive me for remember, but, uh, and, and, and the gentleman from Dell Tech Bank says he believes that the reserves are there, probably from a gaming chair. This is a $65 billion market cap for USD Tether. I don't think this ends well, and I don't think the bottom for crypto is in yet. And it's been really bad because of FTX, Matt. Yeah, Uh, that's that's interesting when it comes to Tether because, you know, I look at it now, it's trading at a buck. It's trading at parity, which it should trade at that, right? But, you know, there's been instances over the last year where it's dipped down. There's been some concerns. It comes back up. Um, but that, that is a major concern because people are sitting there and it's usually the average person who doesn't really delve into it too much, thinking that it's as safe as holding a dollar in their hand. And the argument, I guess, for a lot of people is, well, that dollar in your hand is going to keep going down, but really if it's pegged to it, it's going to go down with it. So you're, you're, you're not really hiding from that. Um, the lack of regulation really concerns me, uh, Brad. You know, I, I am an anti-big government, anti-regulation for most things in life. I think people should be able to do what they want to do without hurting others. However, FTX, we're going to get into that in a moment. And something like this with Tether, it can hurt people. And if it does come out that they do not have the reserves to back it up, you know, we as they call in the money market, which happened back in 08, it can break the buck. And it, we saw what happened, what that did to the markets back in 08 in a very short time. And that could have ramifications that are that are widespread. Um, so let me ask you, and, and do, you, do you think at some point, I hope it doesn't, but you think at some point it does come out that Tether does not have the reserves backing up what they say they have? It is a huge concern, Matt. And I think you make a great point about it. I, that is my concern. And that is my concern that that's going to happen. And I, and I just want to add that not only would the people be burnt holding that USD Tether at that point, But let's think about the systemic effects of the exchanges, where you have over 20,000 tokens in this market currently. And that's important to realize because there's so many small cap tokens and projects out here. And the only way in and out of them is through USD Tether. So people have to start asking themselves, well, what happens if that moment you're talking about comes to light? And there are not proper reserves backing it. I, I, I even add to this, to your point. What if there are subpoenas submitted? What is that going to do alone? Just having subpoenas from the Department of Justice and the U.S. Treasury or what have you, asking them to see the reserves because they refuse to show it to them. What's going to happen to that $65 billion market cap then? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, there's a lot of potential landmines there. And outside of just the money aspect of it, there is the confidence aspect. That if something another you know another you know blow up happens, whether it be tether or something else, how much more can the average investor take? They start questioning the overall crypto market. You know, there's obviously there's always bad actors in every market, but they start questioning the overall market. Institutions, they can't be pay, putting big money, big client money into something that they they're not quite sure if they know what's backing it. So th- that is a major concern for the overall crypto market, in my opinion. Um, so again, let's, we're going to talk about FTX and everything else in a minute, because I know it's a big topic, but while we're on this topic, how do you see the crypto market playing out the next couple of years? Do you think we do have another blow up and will that be the end of it? Or is this something that's here to stay? First of all, I think it's here to stay. You're touching on so many great points, man. I I know we don't have enough time to cover everything, (laughs) right? But I mean, you're just touching so much great stuff. Um, crypto is here to stay more importantly, digital assets. Are here to stay. Which ones though, right? 
And, and, and that's something that matters a lot to me and from where I'm coming from on my channel is how do you navigate a space that is an emerging asset class? You know, this isn't just, you know, a, a new company on the stock market, right? This is a new emerging asset class being created, created before our eyes. It's like being alive when you witness the first bombs go to market. It's that important. And what's really important about it is, is that the next phase of what really brings the legitimacy to this space, aside from regulations and clarity, which are missing greatly. And I am like you. I like open free markets. I don't like a lot of government, the whole bit. Right. But I mean, I also know at 51 that, you know, you have to superimpose the traditional market structure over this new emerging asset class. We have to be able to overlay that and say, OK, I can see what's missing. Exchanges are too centralized. You're buying, selling, trading and custodying all in the same place. You're bottlenecking the market right there. Well, I believe, you know, between USD Tether and I also think the SEC is going to sue some of these exchanges in the U.S., that is going to create that final moment to take us to the threshold where government has to come in. And they're going to have to issue some kind of legislation, at the very least, for stable coins to, to legitimize and regulate the on and off ramp of this market. And there's so much more to it than that. But that is a first place that must start to really clean this space up. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I do a lot of speeches for financial advisors. I'm a former owner of a of an RIA and a broker dealer, and you, know, you, you talk to a lot of financial advisors that are managing tens of billions of dollars, and their clients want it, right? They they want to be in it, but they don't understand it, and they're very hesitant to go at go into uh, this new asset class that is cryptocurrencies without a little bit more regulation. So, in my opinion, we can't get to the level that we think cryptos will get to without some regulation. And again, I, I'm not going to say that very often, but we we need it. And, you know, FTX was a great example. And, you know, talking about exchanges, you see what happened with FTX. Then you look at something in Coinbase. Uh, you know, Coinbase, obviously, their books are open. You know, we, we can see that. You know, that, that's, that's important. And I think that differentiates them as an exchange versus so many others. Uh, Binance, for example, I, do they have everything, you know, backing it up? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I like to believe uh, he does, but I, I don't know there either. Uh, I do know that you know, Coinbase has a, a major four uh, accounting firm. Uh, they have uh, U.S. regulations looking at it. So regulators looking at it. So it's a bit different. And but that's unique. But when it comes to the actual coin, such as Tether, uh, Brad, that, that concerns me because I think we need to have that backed up. And I think, as you just mentioned, you made a great point. Stable coins will be first. Th th those need to be, you know, if th it's called stable for a, a freaking reason. Right. I mean, if they're not stable, what the hell they don't, what are they being called stable coins for? Once that gets passed, I think that's the first leg of regulation and the first leg of legitimacy for some people that are still hesitant for the crypto market. So while we're talking about regulation and everything, let's talk about FTX. Let me, I'll just give you, share your thoughts of FTX. What the hell happened? Well, I mean, look, uh, you know, we could talk for a couple of days on this, but I'll just, you know, the overview is, is that what I've learned for me personally is that we have witnessed a massive crime is what we've missed. We've witnessed and I see mainstream media trying to apologize for, you know, what they have tried to crown as the next JP Morgan or the next Andrew Carnegie or Vanderbilt. And what we see is the next Bernie Madoff in crypto. That's what we see. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the, the funny thing about this is, is that if you think about the macro of this space and the lack of regulation. So what have we had that? I mean, because we do have structure out here. There is a market here. Right. But what we really have is the underpinning of a market that has been robbing the broker dealer across the street and all of their customers to come over here and buy Bitcoin and the other stuff that we have because they can't sell it to you. But we can. Right. If you look deep enough into FTX, you're going to see all the deep legacy players and the money and the regulatory connections and the political connections that show me as it would anyone else that puts the time into it, that the legacy firms were were really backing, I believe, FTX and SBF to rip this underpinning down so they could control it for themselves. And if they bring the market to its knees, they can buy it back at pennies on a dollar. And we're not talking about a crypto market, Matt. What we're talking about for the assets that survive is a use case utility market, a utility market and a utility bull run to come.
And with the clarity and regulation, what we're really talking about is getting a stable coin that's legitimate in place, representative and regulated by a heightened prudential regulator, right? Not just a market regulator, but a prudential regulator like FSOC, right? And the Treasury overseeing this asset and making sure it is absolutely legit. And then from there, you can start to see the suffocation that would take place with the majority of the tokens in the market, because most of them are in and out by USD Tether. So if that goes by the wayside, so does most of the market and tokens that don't actually have an application. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either, because you know what? As much as I hate to agree with Gary Gensler on some things, I think he's got it right that the majority of this market is, in fact, unregistered securities. Now, I don't believe that about Ripple or XRP token, but I, I also uh, believe that the majority of the market is out here facilitating what is a public offering through a token. And that's not a good thing. And that does need to be regulated. So if you if you cut off Tether or at least cut it at its knees to really make it legit, you're going to suffocate a lot of these token projects that are living and dying every day based on the speculation that's happening on their token they're offering. That's a great way to clean the market up. So does that mean that there is an opportunity for other stable coins to step up and potentially take the place of Tether or um, be there as, as, as a true stable coin that has the backing and has the uh, county behind it to show that, 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 okay, listen, you know, these smaller projects use us because we, 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 we're, we're real and we'll prove it. So I think that, that, don't you think there's a great opportunity then for other stable coins to come up? I absolutely do. And, and you know, there's one that's sitting just underneath of Tether in market cap. It's USDC. Now, that's backed by Circle and Goldman Sachs, right? And there we find another legacy player just laying in the bush, right, doing the things and understanding that they're going at it inside the framework, inside the infrastructure, the regulatory framework, being transparent, not telling the DOJ or anyone else who wants to see the books to go fly a kite. That's a bad, bad, mm -hmm. bad idea, right? So what I could see is the crowning of what I hope to see, Matt, because you're touching on something that goes outside of just stable coins. What I'm hoping to see is a regulated stable coin that becomes the retail facing US digital dollar that you could use in the crypto digital asset market or you could use at Walmart, right? Mm -hmm. And and then there's the wholesale central bank digital currency on the back end, keeping that two-tiered financial structure that we currently have in place today, right? You know, and that to me is important because if you if you blur that line, what you're really doing is putting a direct line to the money, to your pocket, to the Fed, which is now digital, and they could turn it off or they could do all kinds of other crazy things that don't let me sleep well at night. And I don't like the idea of that at all. So, you know, it's always darkest before before we turn around and, and it's going to it got pretty damn dark this year. But I, again, I think I don't know if we've seen the bottom yet in the overall crypto market as far as valuation is concerned. I think there could be one more thing, but, you know, one more basic capitulation move to the downside to get all the weak hands out uh, at that point, you know, being the media for over 10 years, interviewing billionaires, uh, you know, most of them made their money when everybody else was running. They they stepped in and, and bought stuff at pennies on a dollar. And that's just that's just how the world works, you know, whether you like it or hate it. You know, that's just the way the world works. You gotta it gotta take some risk to do that and calculate risk, I should say, to do that. Um, you know, back to FTX. I actually had a friend uh, uh in Nicaragua that I ran into I was down there last week. He has been a great story, he started with a hundred dollars about 10 years ago, turned into 4.2 million trading cryptos, never had stuff on exchanges, very uh, libertarian, very anti you know, exchanges, went to make one move, happened to be in that same hour that FTX went down and lost all $4.2 million, um, every penny that he had in that. In, in that. And it's amazing because it, it's sometimes we don't realize it affects real people. This isn't just big money institutions. Oh, they have plenty of money. These are real people that are losing money. And, you know, if he gets pennies on a dollar, he'd be happy, you know, back at some point, if, if anything. And it's, it's you know, kind of hurts me. And, and, it, it, it does give people a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to this industry uh, because there are so many bad players in it. Um, you, you know, SBF, he's able to go in and, and pull the wool over politicians, over media, uh, over very powerful uh, bankers. It's just it's, it's a story that almost doesn't seem true. It seems like a like a like a made for TV movie, honestly. Um, so I'm hoping that this is near the bottom when we have these crazy stories like this, that we're getting the bad actors out. And anytime there's money that goes from nothing to $3 trillion, 
we're going to have bad actors, Brad. And it's going to happen. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't mean crypto is bad. It means there's bad people out there that try to take advantage of opportunities. And we see it in every industry. Uh, so I, I don't I don't want people I want to stay optimistic and say, OK, listen, you know, SPF's not the only one. He, there's, there'll be more. There was some in the past. However, it is a tiny portion of the people that really are passionate about this industry and know where digital assets are going. They believe in the blockchain technology and it will change the world and has changed the world. So I just want people I know we've been really negative for the last 25 minutes or so. But I want people to know that, yes, I mean, I, I still believe in it personally. Uh, I, I think, you know, near term, I don't know what the hell is going to happen. But long term, I agree with you, Brad, that it, it, there will be another bull market in this, what I call an asset class. And everybody agrees with you and I there. Uh, I know Kevin O'Leary had him on a few months ago. He didn't believe it was an asset class, but he's heavily invested in it. But I think eventually this will be a legitimate asset class for most investors out there, just like gold is today. You know, truly the digital gold of the future. So. I know you're an expert on Ripple. Why don't you tell us what your view is on that right now going forward? With you know, that's been a been a back and forth here for such a long time. How do you think that plays out? Okay, so very quickly, I'll just say that SEC versus Ripple case is so much bigger than just SEC versus Ripple over the asset XRP. This case, I believe, is going to set precedent for this digital asset space. This technology that we're talking about, blockchain, digital ledger technology, right? Crypto assets, digital assets. I really believe the case is that important. And if other people look into it, I think they're going to find the same thing. A few things I want to say about it. There are no criminal charges in this case. There is no fraud in this case. This case is literally, what is this? The SEC believes, obviously, it's a security, right? So they're suing over it. And Ripple has made the argument that the SEC basically doesn't even have the right to evaluate it because it's not even a it's not even an investment contract. Right. So that to me is kind of the quick little overview. The other thing I want to say for people, because I know a lot of people aren't aware, I am hugely bullish on this space, as you are, too. And I'm hugely bullish on this case. Uh, Ripple has put on a remarkable defense in this uh, case going to where we are to date, and it is now in the hands of the judge. The final submissions have been made. Uh, a lot of people are legal analysts are expecting a ruling sometime late Q1, early Q2 of next year, and obviously things could settle at any time. What I want to inform people out here on is to understand that when you see the SEC in a court case and understand it's not cr criminal or fraud, th then I want people to understand that Microsoft was sued by the SEC. Tesla was sued by the SEC. Amazon was sued by the SEC. This, to me, is a vetting process. It is a path and a journey that you must go on if you actually have real use case. You can actually solve a problem. And you know what? XRP, the digital asset, actually solves a problem. And from day one, they worked within the system instead of without the outside of the system. And as you know, a revolution comes from within. They are KYC end-to-end -end inside of RippleNet. And they have many, many... Here's the other thing really quickly, too. As people look at the SEC versus Ripple case and what's going on there, because we're waiting for a judgment. And that judgment can be one of a dozen different outcomes or two dozen different outcomes. It's not as simple as win or lose. And I do believe, however it goes, you may see an appeal come from one side or the other, and this argument continue to go forward. And that could certainly happen, but it doesn't mean that it would hurt the company from moving forward necessarily with the use of the asset in the United States. And it's important to understand and know that Ripple has been widely successful because 90 to 95 percent of their customer base exists on the other side of the world. So we can't lose sight of the fact that the U.S. government and the court system needs to understand that the wrong ruling would actually count the United States out of a very important asset for what it can do for the financial world and cross-border payments and the settlement of derivatives products. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. The U.S. seems to always be behind the curve a bit when it comes to innovation in, in all areas. Uh, I mean, just look at China. I know people, most people watching don't like China for different reasons. And but let's let's be honest, you know, their technology innovation has been ahead of us for the last decade, you know, out of nowhere. So uh, there and I'm not just picking China, but other countries tend to be a little bit more liberal uh, and open to innovation versus the U.S. And 
you know, that's good or bad. Take it however you want. But you know, I think we're a little bit behind the curve here when it comes to uh, some of these digital assets. So I obviously I hope there's a, there's a positive ruling and I hope it's something that uh, creates clarity at the end of the day. Yeah, I shouldn't say positive. Ruling. I hope I hope it's a ruling that creates clarity. So other, um, you know, other projects know what to do and know where they stand. And I think that's a big thing here, Brad, you know, even from the project side, you need to know where you stand, right? You know, what, what is the government, how they view us and how are they going to regulate us? And then it allows them to know what they need to do. Because I think a lot of these the projects don't know what th the government wants to see. They don't know what they need. If, if, there's not, if there's not a rule book, how the hell do you play by the rules? And I, again, I think we're behind here in this country, not creating this rule book. And I think a lot has to do with it that a lot of the regulators and politicians don't know what the hell they're doing. So they're getting taught this as they go. And it's, it's, it's almost like the inmates running the asylum. They, they, what the hell do they know? They're just trying to make some money off this and that, like every other damn politician. And it's, it's, it's crazy. But hopefully we got some smart people in the room that come up with a decision that is the honest, true, fair decision at the end of the day. That's all I'm, my fingers are crossed for that. So hopefully uh, we know something sooner rather than later because the uncertainty doesn't help anybody. It right. Does. We want to we want to get a decision no matter what, just so we know we can move on from there and 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 then continue to grow the space from there. <clears throat> Before I let you go, Brad, I usually ask every or I always ask every guest if I were to send you and your family and friends away for 10 years to the island, island of your choice. But you can't take your phone. You can't take anything. But you can buy a stock, a crypto, an asset class, cash, whatever it might be. What's the one kind of investment that you feel comfortable with closing your eyes for 10 years and saying, I come back, I know it's going to be there. It's going to be stronger than ever. And uh, I feel comfortable putting my harder money into it. It's XRP. It's XRP. XRP, the digital asset XRP for me. And Ripple Equity, I hold both. Okay. I, I could have guessed that was going to be the answer, Brad, <laughs> but I, I still had to ask you uh, what that was going to be. Well, thank you so much for joining us for the first time. And we'll get you back as soon as this decision comes out. So you better be ready because I want to get your view on this decision the moment it comes out, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, but early next year, hopefully we here, we get you back on and get your thoughts of exactly what happened. And more importantly, where the industry, XRP and Ripple and everything else goes from there. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And uh, I know you're up in the Northeast, so stay warm because it's chilly as hell. Matt, there. thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And if I could, I just real quick, I want to tell people I am absolutely bullish on this space. I know we spent a lot of time talking <laughs> about the negativity of it, but I am absolutely bullish on this space. And if anybody's confused about the uncertainty of this space, I do have a private group they can check out. Come see my channel, Digital Perspectives, and we'll, we'll get you straight and get everybody level set for where we're going. Yeah, please check it out, especially if you want to know about more about the uh, XRP Ripple case. Please check it out. He's one of the experts out there that actually tells you the truth of what's really going on behind that. So, again, thank you so much, Brad, and uh, we'll have you back on soon. Thank you, Matt. Take care, my friend. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.